Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle D'Amico, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Public Programs at the NYU SPS Center for Global Affairs, or CGA. Since its founding, our goal at CGA has been to prepare global citizens to make a positive impact in the world. We do this through our two graduate programs, one in global affairs, and our recently launched MS in Global Security, Conflict, and Cybercrime. We also offer a variety of professional and personal enrichment courses in the areas of global affairs and fundraising. This includes several professional certificates. And we host free events such as this that expand upon the critical issues and timely topics that we cover in our classrooms. We'll send out a follow-up message to all attendees, so please feel free to reach out with any questions you may have about our programs. We've also reserved some time at the end of today's conversation for questions from the audience, so please feel free to use the Q&A tool. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn this over to tonight's moderator, Dr. Christopher Ankerson, who is a clinical associate professor here at CGA. Chris, the virtual floor is all yours. Hey, Michelle. Um, I'm excited to moderate this discussion tonight, and clearly the timing couldn't be more well, timely, as we explore the contours of the US-China relationship in a post-Trump COVID-19 reality. Indeed, the only thing more timely would have been a seminar on the maximum ship size that should be allowed through the Suez Canal, but we already had this event scheduled, so we'll just go ahead with it. As a wise person once wrote, we make our own history, but we do not make it as we please. We do not make it under our own self-selected circumstances. And so it's likely to be with US-China relations. What sort of history will be made in their future? And to help us answer that, I'm delighted to be joined today by a panel made up of the perfect people to help us figure this out. In alphabetical order, we have Naima Green Riley, who is non resident fellow, Digital Forensics Research Lab, Atlantic Council, and a PhD candidate at the Department of Government at Harvard University. Dr. Raymond Kuo, independent political scientist focused on international security in East Asia. He's previously served as an assistant professor at Fordham University here in New York, and has also worked for the United Nations, the National Democratic Institute, and the Democratic Progressive Party of Taiwan. Lastly, but certainly not leastly, Ali Wen, senior analyst with Eurasia Group's global macro practice, who's focused on US-China relations and great power competition, of which he's actually in the middle of writing a book. He's also non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security and is a non-resident fellow at the Modern War Institute. So thank you all for joining. Let's get right to the first question, which is, and I'm going to ask Ali this in the first instance, but by, by all means, please jump in. Ali, earlier this month when the Biden administration released its interim national security guidance, it had already placed a great deal of focus on China. And here's a, a quote, a couple of quotes from that from that report. We face a world of rising nationalism, receding democracy, growing rivalry with China and other authoritarian states. And here's another one. We must also contend with the reality that the distribution of power across the world is changing, creating new threats. So with that as a starting point, is it authoritarianism or this new distribution of power that's the problem at the heart of US-China relations? In other words, is the clash between US and China systemic ideological or interest-based, do you think? Well, Chris, first of all, thank you so much for the, the generous invitation to be here. And, and I'm just uh, really, really humbled to be in such a gust company. I've, I've learned so much from, from Raymond, from Naima. I continue to learn from both of them. So it's, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, the answer is, uh, I, I guess both, but I, I, and I, I realize that, that sounds a bit sort of evasive or that I'm avoiding the question, but I promise I'm not. I think, the argument that I would make is that the concerns about ideology, the concerns about a sort of authoritarianism, I think that we have to look at them through uh, the lens of the changing distribution of power. And that is to say, uh, I was actually just reading an article by Nick Kristof uh, in the early, in the aftermath of the Cold War. So I think this was either 1990 or 1991. And, and Nicholas Kristof said in this article that with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the one actor in world affairs that probably most purely distills ideologically that which is antithetical to the American way is China. Uh, so this was in 1990 or 1991, but at the time, of course, China wasn't nearly as powerful and influential as it is today. And so when, when many American observers looked at China, they said, we, you know, we hold authoritarianism in contempt. 
the single party, you know, stayed in contempt. But again, there was this imbalance between uh, resentment of ideology or concern over ideology and concern about the material power that uh, China had accrued. I think today what we're seeing is that it is because China is growing materially more capable that there are concerns about the ideological valence. And so by way of contrast, uh, if, if instead of a resurgent China, it were a resurgent, uh, a resurgent power that had perhaps comparable material capacities, you know, militarily, economically, and so forth, but were more ideologically aligned, would the concern be as pronounced? My, my supposition would be probably not as much. So I, I think the, the short answer is that, yes, there is an ideological valence, and I think I would be remiss to dismiss that, but I think we have to look at that ideological valence through the lens of a changing distribution of global power and influence. Great answer. Uh, Raymond, what about you? What do you think? Is this a, a clash that is systemic that we just can't do anything about because it's written into the cards? I'm not going to mention the Greek name that usually goes along with that uh, uh, proposition. Uh, or is it more about the ideology? Or is it simply just interest-based and, and any old power, regardless of its ideology, would be concerning if it were becoming as powerful as China is today? Yeah, I think I'm reminded of Mark Haas's book, uh, The Ideological Origins of Great Power uh, conflict, um, <clears throat> where he talks about how the, the the way great powers conceive of their threats is through ideological lenses. And so I think to kind of piggyback on what Ali had said, it is kind of both, but um, <clears throat> it's fundamentally perhaps a social, uh, at least according to Haas, it's fundamentally a social or perceptual issue that we see ideological distance first, and then we worry about their power second. Uh, so I agree with Ali that <clears throat> it's likely that if the ideological distance were, were narrower, we wouldn't be having as much of an issue. I, you know, I think this also this question also relates to recent conversations about how ideological U.S.-China competition should be. Should we, should we in the United States be making this a democracy versus authoritarianism kind of conflict as we did in the Cold War? Um, you know, there, there are, uh, I think, people at the Quincy Institute, uh, quite a number of academics in the kind of in the restraint sort of school who say, no, no, we should keep this based on pure power politics and interests. I tend to think that is true vis-a-vis -vis China, but I think to some extent, it's impossible for this conflict to actually be non-ideological to some extent because, you know, you, great power politics and competition, interest-based competition with China, no problem. But you also, as a hegemon, have to kind of express a positive vision, a normative vision even, of <clears throat> what you want the system to look like. And so to some extent, I think this question about ideology um, is, is kind of, uh, it, it we focus on China, yes, we can kind of bracket it for a little bit, but we think about our allies, which is kind of a major source of our power. We have to be kind of ideological because they rely upon our ideology to trust the directions and commitments that we make. Great, and I think we'll talk a little bit later about, about allies, but Naima, I'm gonna just ask you the same question with a slightly different twist. So, um, Corey Shake wrote the book Safe Passage and explaining, for example, when Britain was the ruling power and America was the rising power. The reason why there wasn't perhaps uh, such a clash was because they did have this more narrow ideological uh, uh, affinity in the sense that they grosso modo agreed on things like free trade, freedom of navigation on the high seas, et cetera. And therefore we didn't see this cataclysmic clash with the Greek name uh, associated with it usually. Um, what, what is your feeling on that? Well, I think you're right. Um, there is a fundamental difference in the way that the U.S. and the China in China each see uh, how international politics should operate. And so I do think that there's a difference in ideology. But I actually want to be careful here because I think that sometimes when we hear rhetoric around ideological differences between uh, the U.S. and China, that framework can be in, used in a way that's very unproductive and also very harmful. So when Trump officials basically made a clash of civilizations argument, um, they created this framework in which it was us and them, right? And that type of framework almost invariably carries with it some type of xenophobia, some type of stigmatization of people who come from the ethnicity of the other civilization, right? Um, and we saw that with anti-Arab vitriol and attacks during the George W. Bush era. We are seeing that again with anti-Asian hate crimes um, as of late. And so when I say that I think that the clash is ideological, here's what I mean. Um, I think that the US and China just have different ways of seeing how international politics should work. 
So the U.S. for many years promoted a post-World War II Westphalian liberal world order. Um, we hear the Biden administration constantly referring to a rules-based order. And that order um, also places a premium on individual rights, freedoms, often alliances and partnerships. And so current U.S. officials have a very strong vision of working together with partners and allies partially because they want to signal a sharp move away from the Trump administration's America first policy, partially because many countries have actually been very upset not to have the strong backing of the US for the past few years. And partially, I think, because the administration feels that it will need the support of those partners and allies to maintain that order moving forward. Now, on the other hand, China doesn't really operate using alliances, um, doesn't have alliances in the same way as the US does. Um, it tends to pursue strategic partnerships. And so on this particular topic, China will say, on any particular topic, China will say, let's have a strategic partnership. We'll do X, you do Y. Um, and so that's a very different way of thinking about how countries should interact with other places in the world. Um, and so for China, it's not about a rule-based rule order. It's rather about sovereignty. If China does something, other countries should allow us to do it and trust that we have the best interests of other nations um, at the heart of our decision making. Um, even if we have an international dispute of some kind, the main message is that we, China, want everyone else to sort of butt out of the situation and let us handle it um, by ourselves. Um, and due to that fundamental clash, uh, we're starting to see uh, lots of different micro issues in the relationship crop up. I think that's a great way of, of focusing in on the difference between, say, ideology and what we might call style or process or, or method of, of, of operating, which might be uh, uh, slightly different issues. I'm going to stick with you, Naima, and ask you just to, to, as a way of springboard from that last comment, you know, even before Anchorage, many observers have been saying that U.S.-China relations are, are at an all-time low, right? Again, unprecedented, and we can all appreciate the presentism that's in that kind of a statement. But do you think that's fair to say? Are things really as bad as some people are making out? Are US-China relations at an all-time low? I certainly think uh, the US and China have had difficult periods before. Probably the most extreme version of this is that between 1949 and 1979, so over 30 years uh, after the establishment of the PRC, the US didn't have a relationship, a diplomatic relationship with China. So you could say that that's the extreme version of Rocky. But of course, uh, everything about international politics was vastly different at that time. Um, China's position in the world was different. We were in the context of a Cold War with the Soviet Union. Uh, China had an alliance for during the 1950s with the Soviet Union and then they broke off. Um, and so it was just a very different context. Um, there was friction in 1989 after the Tiananmen Square incident um, between China and the US and other democracies. But I think the main difference now is that China has built up this enormous, enormous economic and other hard power resources. And so the ability for China to challenge the US in the ways that we saw at Anchorage last week is new. And I think that's what makes this such a low point. So it's a combination of perhaps the content of the relationship, but also the size or the stakes that the relationship have that make it unprecedented in that sense. It's never been this bad when they've been this equal uh, in their in their power. What do you think, Raymond? Are we are we at an all time low? Or is this just a blip? Or is it something that we might see at the beginning of every administration? It's just a testing of the waters. There's always gonna be testing the waters. But I think I mean, the low point for me is probably the Korean War when you know, American troops and Chinese troops are literally killing each other. Um, <clears throat> but beyond that, we're talking say, you know, post Tiananmen, post Cold War. Um, yeah, Pop, I would actually say it's it's probably never been lower. I think uh, I think Nami is absolutely correct that it is about the relative change in Chinese power. Uh, but also, I think it's coupled with its grand strategy in that you know at least up until say maybe entrance to the WTO, if not a bit earlier, China was very much in this sort of growth phase. So we have to like get our societies in order. We have to get our economy in order and kind of rebuild after you know, say the Great Leap Forward, the Cultural Revolution, those kinds of things. Um, <clears throat> And now I think Goldstein calls that says that they're in the sort of grand strategy of rejuvenation. Insofar as we think there are grand strategies, and that's an effective concept. I think there is something about that here that you combine, you know, the the growth and material power with this sort of 
not quite revisionist, but maybe moderately revisionist approach to international institutions, um, security uh, partnerships, and maybe some deeper elements of the international order. Yeah, I could say like, yes, there is this sort of almost not a systemic challenge in that it's a challenge across all kind of elements of the international system, but a challenge on the systemic elements of the international system where previously that wasn't really the case. It was more about, you know, when, when I think about the Korean War or um, a Sino-Soviet conflict, it was very much about <clears throat> China punching above its weight uh, in order to kind of posture to, uh, to kind of ward off enemies. Here feels like, no, they're not actually punching above their weight. In fact, they might be punching a little bit below or holding back. And as a result, it's creating this sort of challenges to these sort of systemic elements of the international order. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good way of saying it. You know, we haven't really seen the, the maximal use of, of any of dimensions of, of Chinese power at this stage. Um, Ali, what do you think? All time low or no? I think since normalization, yes. I mean, if we're looking, and I think that, uh, and I think that the distinctions that you know that Naima and Raymond posited between sort of you know 1949 through 1979 and then 1979, since I think 1979 is an important inflection point, but since 1979, I think that that assessment is reasonable. What's concerning actually is that, despite what I think is is I think a reasonable conclusion that the relationship uh, hasn't been worse since normalization, it could still yet get a lot worse. Uh, and if you think about, um, if you think about the residual, for all the talk about decoupling, there is still a very high residual uh, level of interdependence uh, in in trade and technology. Uh, we still have, you know, a range of dialogues, sort of formal and uh, informal. Uh, there still is, uh, there still is sort of a baseline of maybe not cooperation, but a recognition that there has to be a baseline of cooperation on transnational challenges, whether pandemic disease, uh, uh, you know, climate change, and so. As bad as the relationship is now structurally, it could yet get a lot worse. I think that that's you know that point is 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 sobering. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a couple of points which I, I think are really important that that Naima and Raymond made. I think one in terms of the ability of China to pose a challenge to the United States, and also kind of the an almost ontological sort of psychological element of the challenge that um, that China poses. And you know, on the ability of China to pose a challenge, I think one of the reasons that China's resurgence is is indeed so challenging for the United States. It's not just, it's not just the accretion of Chinese military power or economic power. It's not, but it's one the speed with which this resurgence has occurred. So I, I think that just when when you have such a significant shift in the international uh, you know, balance of power that occurs as quickly, even uh, you know, even if that balance were brought about, even if that change in the balance were brought about by say you know India or a country that were more like minded, it would still be jarring. But um, you have to keep in mind that you know China is China is a country that you know as recently as you know just a few decades ago it was reeling from you know the worst famine in human history. This is a country that at the end of the Cold War was still relatively quite isolated, quite impoverished, and here we are you know 30 years later. So it's it's the speed of China's resurgence. It's the feeling that China is a country that was supposed to be on the wrong side of modernity's evolution, and yet look at the speed with which it's recovered from the pandemic. Look at the economic numbers. Um, that it's posting. So I think that there's the the speed of China's resurgence, the scale of the resurgence. Um, and I think that we saw, and I imagine that we'll talk more about Anchorage uh, in uh, you know, during this evening. I think what we see is not just a display of, again, sort of military tensions, diplomatic and economic tensions. There's really a narrative competition going on. Um, and I think that if you, I was reading a story the other day that some of the some of the, the choice phrases that uh, Chinese diplomats use at the Anchorage summit are now adorning uh, merchandise that's being sold in, uh, uh, in, in China as a way of kind of you know, rallying nationalistic sentiment. But we really see this narrative competition and I think that we should, we should draw that out. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the, uh, the presentation from China, there was an emphasis on rejuvenation. There's an emphasis on Chinese strength. There's an, a, a, to, you know, to Raymond's point that you know, China no longer needs to be lectured, that, you know, we are presenting ourselves as a peer. And I think that if you look at the narrative, for, and so I think that the narrative is that, look, uh, you may not like what we're doing internally, you may not like how we're conducting ourselves regionally, but the writing is essentially on the wall, that China is kind of inexorably resurgent, you look at our economic centrality, you look at our technological capacity, and those trends continue to, to move apace. And I think that if you look at, um, if you look at the US presentation, there was an emphasis on America's capacity for reinvention, America's capacity for regeneration. Um, and 
And as the Biden administration, uh, as the president says, as the president's top officials say that America is back, that America is sort of getting its act together uh, at home. So whether you look at the passage of a $1.9 trillion stimulus package, the acceleration of the vaccine rollout. Um, so there's the sense, look, America is reinventing itself at home. And that sure, uh, we, we certainly have socioeconomic challenges, but we reckon, them, we reckon with them openly. We had a discussion that's not only on display for the American public, but it's on display for the rest of the world to see. And that abroad, the United States is reinvesting in, in and repairing alliances and partnerships. And I think that a crucial element of this new foreign policy will be the emphasis on the Quad uh, and, and this emphasis on sort of newly invigorated Asian Pacific diplomacy. So I think that I would just say that what we saw at Anchorage, I think kind of presages a narrative competition that I think is likely to intensify. So China, I think, is likely to continue saying, you know, we are ascendant, we will continue to be ascendant, particularly economically and technologically, and that economic and technological momentum is going to help sustain us. And I think that the United States is going to say, um, we've been, you know, we've been, you know, perhaps we were down and out, but many observers within and without have predicted sort of terminal American decline before, those prognostications proved premature, and we're going to prove um, that China is not 10 feet tall. So I think we're going to see this narrative competition intensify. Yep. Okay. Let, let's stick with um, with Anchorage, which now, you know, has been entered into a diplomatic atlas with places like Fulton, Missouri, cities that perhaps didn't have any salience internationally previously, but, but now will certainly have some place in a history book somewhere. So Raymond, let me ask you, there was a heated exchange, obviously, that was held in front of the cameras and, and whether that was posturing or not. Um, it was seen as, you know, indicative, at least, of how bad things have got between the two countries. Um, other people said, no, it was kind of necessary, cleared the air, allowed people to kind of get, you know, more serious about the substantive parts of the relationship and the conversation that had to happen. Where do you come down on that, uh, those choices? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in thinking about, say, Yang Jiz's um, kind of 18, 17, 18 minute kind of spiel riff that he did in the very beginning, what's interesting to me is that I've always understood him to be, he can flip the switch really easily, right, to do a little armchair psychology here, which is probably, which is absolutely not my field. Um, <clears throat> he can be extremely conciliatory, and then in the next second be extremely aggressive. Um, but I remember, I think it was a State Department employee who said that, you know, whether whatever side he's on, whether he's being conciliatory or aggressive, he never seems like he's out of control. And so that strikes me as pretty important that, you know, if this is a, if this is a genuine heated exchange, an unexpected one to some extent, like a natural reaction, you expect more, I don't know, vociferousness or demonstrativeness. Um, and so what strikes me is that, A, yes, I, I think this was probably a, a kind of a necessary first step in the relationship. But what's particularly interesting to me is who are blinking on the one hand and uh, Yang, on the other hand, who are they kind of trying to signal to? And for Yang, I think it's pretty clear that it's the, uh, the Chinese domestic politics. Um, <clears throat> but for uh, Blinken, you know, I guess it's, what's interesting to me is the fact that the Biden administration is going to hold on to some of the leverage points or a, a, a competitive attitude that the Trump administration has started off with. And then <clears throat> through the course of this sort of comprehensive policy re review that they're doing, well, kind of pick and choose which pieces they want to keep. Um, but at the very least, it didn't start off, uh, you know, it didn't start off in a, in a conciliatory way. It's giving the Biden administration room to back up if they need to. Okay, fair enough. Naima, I mean, I guess to look at the other side of the Anchorage uh, 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 interface, it kind of ended on a good front, at least in terms of how it was packaged by the participants, right? Yang came out and said that the, the, the talks had been frank, beneficial, and constructive. And it, even Blinken came out and said there was a list of issues where, you know, there was common interest and, and ripe for progress. Things like Iran, DPRK, Afghanistan, climate change. What are your thoughts? Uh, from a, such a shaky start, can we t take anything really constructive out of the back end of the conference? Or was this really just meant to kind of paper over some of the cracks that had been exposed at the beginning? I think there actually is a benefit. So one of the things that the um, the Biden officials who were at the, at the talk set, continually said in their remarks was that we're going to be uh, direct, we're going to be frank, and we're going to tell you where we think there are issues of conflict, we are going to tell you where we think that there are issues of concern, and we want to lay it out on the table. And 
in diplomacy, that's an important thing to do, right? Because you start to have misunderstandings and you start to have the risk of greater conflict when there are misunderstandings, when something isn't clear. Um, and so it seems like uh, from what we can tell from the readout to the end, both sides to some extent felt like they got their, uh, their point on the table. Um, they mentioned a number of areas. So in particular, uh, Secretary Blinken and um, Jake Sullivan mentioned a few areas where um, the US and China could cooperate uh, moving forward. This is big because for the past four years, many people like myself, many people in the China sphere and many people more broadly have been asking the question, can the US and China can cooperate on anything? Um, and so the, the four issues that um, the US side identified were Iran, North Korea, Afghanistan, and then climate change. And what's interesting is that there are two groupings of those four issues that sort of explain them in different ways. So on the first two issues, Iran and North Korea, we can think of those as being issues that the US would be interested in cooperating with China on because uh, these are two countries where China has a special relationship that could actually benefit the US's ability to reach those countries. So China just signed a strategic partnership with Iran that will last for 25 years. Of course, the US relationship with Iran is not very good. Um, and China also has had for a long time a special relationship. Sometimes the Chinese call it a little brother relationship uh, with North Korea meaning that it may be possible for the Chinese government to help um, create better inroads for communicating with those two countries um, and even bring those two countries potentially to the table for discussion on um, issues that are important to the United States, denuclearization, things like that, um, because the Chinese have more leverage than the US or the EU would. Um, the other two issues, there's just a need <laughs> to talk about both of them. Um, and so you could see how, how both the US and China are interested. So on climate change, there's clearly a global threat of climate change, so it's not surprising. And this is an issue that many people have pointed out as an issue for cooperation between the US and China for many years. Um, on Afghanistan, the US and China actually have very different uh, interests in their relationships with Afghanistan, but they overlap. So the US of course is concerned with upholding the Afghan government. Um, there are still US forces in Afghanistan 20 years after the 2001 invasion um, under George W. Bush. And the Trump administration made a commitment to withdraw all American troops by May of this year, but we are going to have to see whether the Biden administration actually holds that commitment or not. China, on the other hand, is interested in its relationship with Afghanistan because of concerns about ties between insurgent groups in Afghanistan and Uyghur separatist movements in Xinjiang. So a lot of people have focused on Xinjiang, but the rationale that the Chinese government gives for the atrocities that are being committed in Xinjiang um, are that uh, there's a real separatist threat and terrorist threat in Xinjiang. And so in China's eyes, it'd be at best for the US to withdraw from Afghanistan uh, because they don't want U.S. troops sort of on its back door. But at the same time, if the U.S. withdraws, there is a concern about whether the power of certain insurgent groups will increase and therefore uh, the separatist movements in China will become more of a threat. Um, so it's interesting because here you actually have interest aligning in that both countries want stability for different reasons. And so I do think that the issues that were identified are important ones. Um, the question remains whether the two countries are going to be able to pursue cooperation on those issues, or if the noise surrounding everything else, the, the conflict in other arenas will actually keep the two countries from being able to successfully um, come to some agreement on the issues that were brought up. I think that that's a great um, a great way of looking at it that they're not just four random issues, but they they actually have um, uh, some interrelationships. Let me turn that and use it a bit of a bridge, Ali. Um, you know that if you were able to do that, if you were able to get that cooperation, in some sense, it would form this elusive reset with China that the Biden administration says it's looking for. And maybe the last time we heard the term reset, it was when Obama was looking for a reset with Russia, which didn't turn out very well. What do you think a reset with China would look like? And more importantly, is it likely to happen? So I think that there's already, I think we see 
uh, and, and I think that you know, Naima, uh, you know, you know, broke it down really well. I think that we already are seeing from some of the readouts from Anchorage. I don't know if you would call it a reset, but kind of a set, a, a certain calibration. Uh, I think that the the relationship it's structurally is very challenging. I think that strategic tensions between the United States and China are going to continue to increase. But I think that particularly under certainly vis-a-vis -a, -vis a Trump administration, I think that from from the American side, I think that the competition is going to be conducted in a more disciplined fashion, in a more rigorous fashion. And so even though um, even though structurally strategic tensions will continue to intensify, um, I don't think that the, the US-China relationship is likely to experience the kind of frenzied oscillations that we saw during the Trump years, and I think particularly during 2020. Um, but I think that what Anchorage is, uh, what Anchorage shows is that um, competition and cooperation will cohabitate. They have to. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, Naima, particularly in talking about climate change, makes an essential point, which is that the United States and China right now, they might be loath, and this goes to Raymond's point about signaling, um, you know, the United States and China both, they want to project confidence to, to one another. They want to project confidence to their respective domestic publics. They want to project confidence also to, to, uh, to other countries that are watching this, this bilateral competition. So they might not speak too much or they might not amplify the volume too much uh, when talking about cooperation. But I think that there's a recognition that as much as you know, both sides might be loath to say it, neither the United States nor China can assure its own vital national interests without salvaging some kind of baseline of cooperation with the other. And I think uh, COVID-19, uh, I, I think offers arguably the most you know, compelling and visceral il illustration. And I mean, let's posit a counterfactual. And I realize it's a, uh, it's a somewhat grim counterfactual, but I think that you know, we, should, we should broach it. Um, imagine if when the World Health Organization had declared the coronavirus had sort of upgraded or I guess downgraded its, its declaration of the coronavirus from epidemic to pandemic, Imagine if that declaration had occasioned emergency cooperation between the United States and China, akin to that which we saw in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. So you remember back in 2008, Lehman Brothers collapses, the United States and China both recognized very quickly, okay, we have this, this economic recession train that's barreling down the tracks, and if we don't act quickly, we could end up going from a recession to a, some kind of repeat of what we saw in the 1930s, namely a global depression. And so the United States and China uh, they very quickly activated cooperation and talked amongst themselves. They activated the G20, and they were able to push the uh, push the brakes on that train. And obviously, 2008, 2009, it was still economically devastating, but it could have been a lot worse. What I find very concerning is with COVID-19, not only did COVID-19 not occasion that kind of emergency cooperation between Washington and Beijing, it actually set in motion a chain of events. If you look at the health fallout, the economic fallout, the geopolitical fallout, it set in motion a chain of events that actually brought the US-China relationship to its lowest level since normalization. I think that there's a recognition in retrospect as the world, albeit unevenly, but as the world seems to be hopefully charting its way out of this, uh, this pandemic, I think that as we look back, there's a recognition that if the United States and China had cooperated, we, mi we might be, perhaps we would have been having this panel in person. Uh, perhaps we would have been talking in person, but that there are very real consequences. So I think that if you look at the readout from Anchorage, I think that, I don't know if I would use the term reset, but I think it's basically the sense of look um, in certain domains, whether it is, uh, you know, whether it is emerging technologies, I think in particular, uh, emerging technologies, um, the, the balance of power in, militarily in the Asia Pacific, there are certain domains in which competition I think is gonna intensify. And I think that both sides have accommodated themselves to that reality. But there's also the recognition that cooperation will endure because it has to. Um, and I think that I would just, I, I'll end with one last point, which is that um, you know, one difference between, or one, I guess, complication or wrinkle in the US-China relationship among many, particularly among all, a lot of talk about, is this a new Cold War? The Cold War ended with the dissolution of one of the competitors. We know how the Cold War ended. Um, I think that the United States and China uh, do appreciate, or at least they should appreciate, the reality of each other's endurance. Uh, I think that China is is cer China certainly has competitive liabilities at home and abroad, but I think that it's unlikely that China is going to collapse sort of in a spectacular Soviet-style fashion. There's sort of perennial talk about American decline. America certainly has its challenges as well at home and abroad, but I don't think that, I think that America does have significant competitive strengths. I think it also does have a capacity to reinvent itself. And so the challenge then is, um, 
when you when you have a relationship that is marked by intense competition, uh, unavoidable cooperation, you have two countries that are not going away, they are going to endure, um, then the question becomes, so from, a, from an American perspective, the question is not, how do you achieve a decisive victory, but instead, how do you sustain a very complex modus vivendi? There isn't a terminal outcome. And I think that that, that recognition that we're talking about the management of a very sort of fluid, unknown kind of uh, modus vivendi, requires a very different kind of diplomacy. And I think, you know, Naima, you know, we have, in Naima, you know, we have sort of our, our, our resident diplomat, you know, she would be, you know, far more, you know, able to speak about this than, than myself. Um, but it requires, I think, a far more different uh, a, a, and more challenging diplomatic toolkit uh, than the pursuit of a decisive victory. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, I think, that difference is often misunderstood when we talk about pitching this as a Cold War, and we'll talk a little bit about the reconcil reconcilability of some of the positions in just a second. But I want to switch gears just slightly here and, and pick up a point that was mentioned earlier by, by Naima. And the major plank in the Biden foreign policy across all dimensions has been this re-engaging with allies, right, and working the desire to work with like-minded countries. Um, I, I think you can't see Anchorage except as something that occurred after uh, meetings by Blinken and Sullivan with major US allies in Asia. And it's not probably lost on many people that after leaving Alaska, Chinese diplomats headed for a meeting with Russia. So I, I want to bring in other countries, not just focus just on this US-China relationship. So let me turn to Raymond. What does the US-China relationship mean for other countries? And, and who do you think has the most to lose or gain from this relationship going one way or the other? Sure, I think by way of answering, I'll, I'll circle back a little bit to the previous question about reset. Um, I don't know if I necessarily see a reset between US-China relations um, in that you know, the Trump administration was already kind of a big reset from let's say the 20 or 30 years going before. Uh, I expect that the Biden administration, I mean, it's a little bit too early to tell, um, <clears throat> but keeping some of the competitive aspects, uh, confrontational aspects, while at the same time as Ali is discussing, like trying to, uh, uh, work on the where we need where there needs to be cooperation but i think what's the real difference for me kind of the real reset in my mind for the biden administration needs to be trump is a reset towards its allies towards american allies so we're going to get them on board with some of the confrontational or competitive elements uh say tariffs um <clears throat> uh you know security maritime competition um that to me is the biggest reset and so when i think about like say the u.s china relationship and what it means for other countries in particular i think a transition to the biden administration kind of elevates the standing of these of these kind of third party states and also puts it, it eliminates a lot of the contradictions that occurred in the Trump administration. That, you know, if you're gonna pursue a trade war with China, don't do the trade war with the EU at the same time. Um, and I think we're already starting to see some dividends from that, that uh, the US and the EU are, co are cooperating on, uh, uh, there, I think there's, um, I forget what, what the name of the forum is, but they're, they're, it's, re it's being restarted on China between the United States and the EU, I think next week. Uh, we've got uh, the meeting with the Quad, as well as I think, uh, Chris, as you mentioned, Blinken's meeting with Japan and South Korea. And all of this is kind of what you want to do when, and I don't mean this in a bad way, when you want to gang up on your enemy. You work with your friends first. You get make sure everybody's on the same, uh, is on the same page first, and then you present a reunited front to uh, your the, your opponent. Whereas the previous administration kind of you know was shooting at everybody and wasn't able to gather that sort of political or diplomatic weight. Uh, for me, this is kind of the key difference between even though Biden may keep the competitive aspects held over from Trump, it's the cooperation side. It's the you know uh, the the relationship with your own partners that really sets it apart. Great. Now, now that you've circled back and answered my previous question, can you answer this question? Who do you think has got the most to lose or gain from this relationship? Fair enough. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, U.S. allies. So uh, Japan, South Korea, um, Taiwan, certainly, maybe the Philippines, even though Taiwan's not an ally. Uh, <clears throat> also, security partners in Asia, but, uh, verging security partners from the United States, Vietnam, um, is definitely on that list. Um, <clears throat> India and Australia, absolutely as well. So there's this idea that you're going to get you know, coordinated competition with China is going to elevate the relationship amongst all these states. Now, there are going to be political factors within these states that don't like this competition. I'm thinking most particularly about South Korea. Um, but generally speaking, I think the issue that 
uh, sort of plagued the Trump administration. Uh, it definitely plagued the incoming Biden or the Biden administration was incoming was whether or not Biden would uh, whether or not Biden would engage with trade offs between the cooperative the the stuff that the U.S. needs to cooperate with China on and the stuff that the U.S. needs to compete with China on, and whether, for example, would the uh, Biden administration sell out Taiwanese arms sales in favor of a better trade relationship with China or allow for <clears throat> the Chinese to have greater uh, dominion in the Southeast China seas in exchange for, um, I don't know, probably the same sort of thing. Uh, at least based on Anchorage and based on kind of the people, the, the personnel that, uh, that uh, Biden has staffed the State Department and the Department of Defense with, it seems like uh, it's calmed a lot of those fears. I'm sure they're still there. I mean, sort of classic alliance politics, you always want your patron to do as much as possible and maybe do all of it instead of you doing it. Um, but it's certainly calmed a lot of those fears. And so I think the big winners in this kind of shift in the relationship are US allies. Okay, and, and I, I take it that clearly they would be the biggest losers if this all goes into the ditch, right? So yeah. Naima, let me, let me pivot to you for a second and ask, is there an intermediate institution whether it's the G20 or maybe the UN or, or a key country, do you think that can maybe act as a, as, a, as a focal point or a fulcrum for this dyadic relationship? Is there somebody out there that not only is going to win or lose from this, but actually might be a catalyst for improving the relationship? Uh, so I think that the, what it looks like the, the strategy moving forward is, is to actually create as Raymond was mentioning, these different groupings. So rather than there being one particular institution or one particular organization or country that would play an intermediary role in different situations, bring in different groups of people who can help to mediate. Um, as somebody who focuses a lot on China, but also on the Indo-Pacific region, um, I know that particularly for Southeast Asia, there was a real feeling of loss during the Trump administration because the Obama administration put a lot of effort into building ties with Southeast Asian nations, into um, investing in ASEAN. So going to ASEAN summits, that was something that the United States did not do even as an observer before the Obama administration. And so that meant that countries in the region felt that they had something to hedge against when they felt uh, the Chinese government trying to be more coercive in their relationships with the Southeast, Southeast East Asian nations um, or to have influence that uh, they felt was undue. Um, so once the Trump administration came into power and decided that first of all, alliances weren't important, but certainly not aligned. I mean, the main focus in Trump's rhetoric was about Europe, about NATO, didn't even mention uh, Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia was sort of left to the wayside. There was this real feeling that um, the US had just reneged and abandoned a lot of these countries. And so they could no longer do the hedging that they used to do. And so I say that because I think that institutions, multilateral institutions like um, ASEAN, like some of the other regional or, uh, institutions will be places where the Biden administration can focus in the future. And we haven't necessarily heard as much rhetoric about that. But the new thing that seems to be on the table for the Biden administration is to create groupings that aren't necessarily even formalized of democracies, such as uh, advanced Western democracies, um, to create groupings of democracies in East Asia, so South Korea, uh, an ally, Japan, an ally, to some extent, Taiwan, who has, Taiwan has suffered a lot of um, influence and uh, sort of pressure campaigns from uh, the Chinese government for a long time. Um, one more thing that I'll say here is that we saw an instance of this sort of uh, impromptu grouping just this week, right? Because um, the US along with uh, several other countries, so Britain, Canada, Australia, uh, not Australia, Britain, Canada, and the EU um, all uh, put sanctions on China for human rights abuses, I refer to Xinjiang and Australia and New Zealand, who did not necessarily put the sanctions um, into effect, supported this action with a statement. Of course, there was a very rapid response from the Chinese government that many have heard of, uh, wherein sanctions were placed not only on government officials and legislators from the EU, but also on uh, individuals who are scholars or work at think tanks or on the you know, think tanks themselves. Um, but this is an indicator that 
the Biden administration is going to operate uh, with groups. They feel that there's strength in numbers. And so to the extent that they can create associations with different types of like-minded actors in different parts of the world, the administration, I think, will continue to do so. Yeah, I think that's 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 great. I think that really, in some senses, as, as Raymond has said, it's a continuation to an extent. Uh, I think it's not quite as useful to look at the starkness of, of, of each administration as if there's nothing that carries over. But this Democra League of Democracies type approach that even Pompeo was campaigning on uh, doesn't go a million miles away from this. And people like Mattis, for example, in the previous administration did see the value of uh, of allies. So um, we talked a little bit about the quad, uh, which we can talk about maybe uh, at the end again. But I want to ask kind of a question that, that Naima kind of in, in some senses rose. Is America willing to kind of go the full next step, Ali, and maybe join CPTPP, for example, and make a real clear signal that they want uh, Asia to be back as a, a um, area of interest and not just on the issues that they necessarily see as as front of house. So one of the one of the Biden administration's major challenges, but I think also opportunities strategically, is to make this much vaunted you know pivot or rebalance. You know, take your you know your your pick of word um, that has really eluded in, uh, previous administrations since nine eleven. And so obviously, it you know the Bush administration was you know, was preoccupied with counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. You know, the Obama administration. So if you look at the Obama administration, it formally announces a rebalance to the Asia Pacific at, at the outset of 2012. But you know, the developments in the Middle East uh, uh, impose a lot of pressure on the administration to not to abandon the rebalance, but to, uh, to not rebalance to the extent that it wanted to. And then, of course, you had the Russian uh, incursion into Ukraine and then subsequent annexation of Crimea. So the Obama administration, for various reasons, found that its ability to, to rebalance to the Asia Pacific was challenged. Um, I think that the Biden administration has clearly telegraphed that it wants to be the administration that that sort of breaks that that thread and really makes that re uh, rebounds happen. So if you look, for example, uh, if you look at the interim strategic guidance uh, put out by the White House, it says it talks about three priority regions. It talks about uh, it talks about uh, the Americas. It talks about uh, Europe, and it talks about uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and I think that there is a a desire to to rebalance not only in word. Uh, which previous administrations have done, but also in, indeed, and so, uh, but there are going to be several litmus tests of that. Uh, you know, number one will be, uh, you know, we've talked about the quad. Um, I think a critical litmus test for the quad will be the extent to which it can evolve from a grouping that's motivated principally by shared concerns to one that is motivated principally by affirmative undertakings. And so, I think that a uh, what a coalition, whether it's formal or informal, I think it can only. It, I don't know if it can be held together in perpetuity if it's defined solely on the basis of what it's concerned about or what it opposes. Um, and I think that that's why it's encouraging. It seems that the Quad is expanding its remit. So yes, the, the pretext for its affirmative undertakings is of course the resurgence of China, but um, with that pretext, it's starting to expand its remit affirmatively. So it's getting involved in efforts uh, to export vaccines to Southeast Asia. Um, there is a, a Quad uh, emerging technology working group. So it seems that it's it's broadening its remit. So I think the one litmus test of this ability to rebound to the Asia Pacific in, in deed and not just in word will be um, sort of wither the Quad, number one. You know, number two, to your point, uh, Chrissy, as you were suggesting in your question, um, economics. Uh, this is a point you, you talked about the TPP. Um, the Prime Minister of Singapore, th now this was prior to the 2016 election, we're not even talking about 2020. The Prime Minister of Singapore said prior to the 2016 election, um, he said that, look, uh, an asset test of America's credibility in the Asia Pacific will be, do you actually sort of get TPP done? And he said that military power is important, which it obviously is. Diplomatic engagement and presence is important, um, but economics really matters. And I think that one of the reasons that uh, there's sort of a, uh, an expression that sometimes you hear when you talk with interlocutors, particularly in Southeast Asia, they say uh, the United States is a uh, the United States is a strategic hope. China is a geographic reality. China is the resident power in the Asia Pacific. Its economic centrality is growing, and so I think that even many even many countries in in China's periphery that have very significant apprehensions about its military modernization, about its strategic ambitions. Um, they feel that they can't afford to decouple from China to the same extent that the United States might want to. Uh, they see that China's 
again, it's, it's economic gravitational pull uh, is, is growing. And so I do think that over time, until, if the United States wants to sort of hold its own uh, with, uh, you know, with China in the region, I do think that it's going to have to up its, its economic game. And that's why I'll be very curious to see, you know, Raymond mentioned in, in his remarks that the administration is conducting a series of, of reviews of China policy. Um, I'll be very keen to see uh, what those deliberations result in, particularly on the economic and, and technological front. So, I mean, just to, to wrap up, certainly, I think if you look at the early indications, oh, and one last point I'll make. Um, I think it's very telling that on the on the National Security Council, the largest directorate, it's the Indo-Pacific Directorate, and I think that that's not accidental. So I think if you look at if you look at the staffing uh, of the different agencies, if you look at the interim uh, strategic guidance from the White House, if you look at and then the president himself, you know, President Biden um, has I, I think has grown increasingly skeptical of sort of the strategic utility of these interventions in the Middle East, has expressed a desire to rebalance to the Asia Pacific. So certainly a lot of the elements, I think the foundational elements are in place, uh, and I think the whether uh, you know whether those actually you know materialize over time remains to be seen. But I think that the, the early commitments, the early signals, certainly seem to suggest that this is an this is an administration that wants to be the one that says we were able to rebalance in earnest uh, to the Asia Pacific. That, that's, that's uh, I think, a, a very good way of looking at it. it. It strikes me, though, there's an interesting, perhaps not just counterfactual, but, but counter point to looking at this, that if you want to take on China, then as, as you've all said, then grab together a team of like-minded individuals, which is a, but we can also flip that around and say, if you want to gather a team of like-minded individuals, focus on China, right? To some extent, picking China is that it is so salient. How else do you get, if you're talking about the Middle East, India is not necessarily going to be interested in what you've got to say. So there is a bit of a mutual dynamic there. And given that the Biden administration also wants to repair uh, bridges with its allies, uh, then picking China as a China first out the gate kind of issue uh, certainly gets that solidified now. Uh, and then perhaps those relationships are useful in, in other dimensions later. Uh, Australia, South Korea, Japan, if you don't have to worry about those vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, maybe it's a bit easier to talk about North Korea, for example. Um, let me get to, uh, and Raymond, you're going to get a chance in just a second. Let's Let's move to the future a little bit here. And I wonder if there isn't uh, some at the heart of this, some sort of insoluble paradox, maybe I'll be a bit of a pessimist here, that um, the possibility of win-win is, is often put out there, that it is possible to, to get enough of everything to make this relationship work. But I think we can also look at it in pretty stark terms in the sense that um, if America is looking to have a geopolitical balance that's in its favor, um, a human rights record and, and human rights priorities that are that it can live with and are, is comfortable with, as well as domestic prosperity, perhaps it's not easy to get to, to reconcile all three of those at the same time vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, so for example, are you going to have to drop that human rights uh, piece out? Uh, for example, we've even seen some of the pressure put on Myanmar following the, the junta there, um, not quite go as far as, as some human rights advocates would like, for fear of pushing Myanmar further into the geopolitical orbit of China, for example. So there's still these kind of trade-offs that are that are having to be made. So if if we're is coexistence with China possible if the US wants to re retain or, or, or regain some preeminence and dominance in the Indo-Pacific? Are we are we giving ourselves uh, uh, you know, illusions and delusions that that this win-win is possible if the real stated aim here uh, is dominance, if not outright victory, as you were saying, Ali. Let me ask Naima first. I question whether the main aim of the United States is what you characterize as victory. Because as I sit here, I'm not sure that I can necessarily think about what a victory would be. You mentioned um, predominance or preeminence in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, but I don't know that there's a possibility of Indo-Pacific region in which there's just one preeminent uh, actor anymore, right? It seems like the best possible solution is that the United States still has some ability to be able to uh, to pursue its interests, to uh, protect its allies and its partners in the region, but not necessarily to have this total preeminence. And you're right, that was the conversation that was happening uh, 
five, 10 years ago, but I think that maybe the, the vantage point, the outlook has changed significantly as of late. And so um, when we talk, first of all, it's interesting that you ask is if win-win is possible because I think that when the Chinese, when the Chinese government, when Chinese officials use that term, um, and they often do, that's how we started to use it. Um, I think that what they are looking for is an ability to uh, sort of agree on certain issues uh, very directly and just leave everything else sort of not touched. And what's interesting about that is, I honestly think that we are moving towards a place where if the two countries are gonna agree on anything, it's gonna happen in the context of not agreeing on a lot of other things. I don't think that we're going to get to a point where the US can have a con totally conciliatory relationship with China anymore, but rather if we can identify particular issues that are a concern to both countries and we have to narrowly try to, try to find that win-win or try to find that area of uh, cooperation and, and carve it out and seek the, the collaboration specifically in that, in that issue. And so I guess my answer is that um, I think that it is possible for the United States and China to have areas in which they collaborate successfully. Um, but I think that those, er those areas will be uh, very targeted and very specific rather than just a broad uh, relationship in which there is a, a total win-win on every account. Sorry, thank you for that. Uh, Raymond, you wanted to come in on that question? Uh, actually, it was on the previous one, but sure, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned this sort of tripartite set of interests between the US and China, and geopolitics and security, human rights is one, as a second one, and, and economic uh, exchange, prosperity, that kind of thing, as a third one. And I suppose my view on that is this is, we've been, the US and China have been making trade offs across these three dimensions for at least since normalization of relations. Uh, I think perhaps the, the maybe the heyday when the US perhaps balanced all three was prior to, uh, after China opened up and prior to uh, Chinese accession to the WTO, because then you could, the US was preeminent militarily secure in terms of security as well. And you could leverage most favored nation status to try to in some way either cudgel or put pressure on the Chinese to improve their human rights, uh, political, political liberalization, that kind of thing. Um, and at least, you know, since then, if not since WTO accession, if not before, that kind of really powerful economic cudgel has been lost. And so the U.S. has been having to kind of, uh, you know, side, uh, focus on geopolitics and security and economic relations to the detriment, to some extent, of human rights because it just doesn't have the lever anymore. Um, and so when I want, and I fully agree with Naima when, it, when she says that win-win means a very particular thing in the Chinese sort of diplomatic discourse. I also think that, you know, it's, it has a sort of kicking the can down the road uh, element uh, kind of flavor to it. And I don't think that's really possible anymore that the given domestic changes in the United States and in China that, you know, it's not as possible to just kind of set things aside and table them for further discussion. They're just going to come up through the kind of either the domestic political process or through, you know, pressures from allies or just, you know, the kind of natural tensions of the relationship itself. Great. Uh, Ali, I want to, there's a lot been made about the personal relationship that, that exists or, or is purported to exist between President Biden and, and, and Xi Jinping from uh, allegedly when they were both vice presidents together, for example. And some are looking forward to this possibility that we can, in some senses, that will be a part of the reset, this taking it to a more personal level. Um, and there's talk that perhaps they'll even meet personally soon, uh, probably still virtually, but, but maybe as early as April. Do you think this focus on personal ties is, is meaningful in any way? It's certainly important, um, but I think that it's the the individualistic and the structural are always interacting uh, with one another, and I think that they temper one another. And so, uh, I think that even if you have um, even if you have a baseline for uh, sort of a, a constructive you know dialogue at the individual level at a very very high sort of level between individuals, I think that there are powerful one there are certain structural attentions that aren't going to dissipate regardless of the types of interactions that they might have. And, there, and I think that you know, Raymond was making this point, there also are very powerful domestic factors uh, in both countries that I, I think will, will intrude. So if you look at public opinion, 
uh, in, in both countries, if you look at elite opinion in both countries, um, I think that both public opinion and elite opinion in both countries are sort of amplifying those sort of extant structural tensions. And so I think that what, um, what that high level dialogue could do, I think it could help to circumscribe and delimit the competition. I think it could help to impose some guardrails if indeed you have sort of a, a directive coming from the highest levels that we have to impose certain guardrails on competition. Um, I don't know that it can necessarily um, sort of shift the, the overall you know, thrust or momentum of the relationship. Um, I just wanted to make, um, it, it, could, could I make one point just on, a, on an earlier, just, just one quick point on a, um, on, on, a, on a discussion that came up in terms of sort of a, how do you bring together allies and partners and, and do, you, do you use, you know, to what extent do you sort of use China to, to enlist allies and partners? I think it, it, it's tricky. I think that definitely um, what we saw in 2020 was that you know China's you know diplomacy, its so-called wolf warrior diplomacy, did have a very powerful catalyzing effect in terms of uh, taking this kind of abstract grouping, namely the Quad, and imbuing it with with sort of newfound momentum. And so I think there there is an instance in which China's uh, diplomatic and military overreach does imbue uh, uh, some of these alliances and partnerships with newfound vigor. Uh, but I think that we should, and, and I think that we in the United States, we should take advantage of those opportunities. We should essentially capitalize on that overreach when it occurs. Um, but I think that it's important not to go too far. And that is to say, um, the United States shouldn't, shouldn't go to its allies and partners and make them feel as if it's basically trying to instrumentalize them as part of its own competition with China. So I think that in other words, what I'm getting at is that um, the United States should go to its allies and partners and say, look, um, we want to work with, you know, we have some big team projects ahead of us. Uh, what does a post COVID-19 international system look like? Um, uh, I think that's obviously a huge undertaking. Um, what are more effective strategies for managing sort of the full panoply of transnational challenges that we've talked about this evening, pandemic disease, climate change, arms you know, proliferation. So I think going to allies and partners and saying we have these big ticket, you know, world order, uh, you know, kind of items on the table, and you know, we all bring you know, different sort of strengths uh, to those to those tasks. Um, and within those affirmative undertakings, saying that we're going to have to contest with China selectively, but I think that basically embedding competition with China within an affirmative undertaking, I think that's much more likely to um, that's much more likely to sort of hold those alliances and partnerships uh, uh, and, and give them strength. And interestingly, I mean, if you look at, for example, the Prime Minister of Australia. I gave a speech uh, this past November uh, at the policy exchange think tank in the UK in which he said some, and he expressed frustration. He said that sometimes, you know, outside observers outside of Australia make it seem as if Australia can't conceive of its national interest or foreign policy without looking through the aperture of US China competition. But he said, no, we, we can and we will. And so he basically was saying, yes, US China competition is it is an, an important prism through which to look at Australia's foreign policy, but it is not the only prism. And so I guess I would just start by saying that I think that the United States, as it approaches its allies and partners, obviously it doesn't want to ignore China. You can't ignore China. And I think that where China overreaches diplomatically and militarily, the United States should take advantage. Uh, but I think that the United States, it, it shouldn't make its alliances and partnerships solely about uh, the, managing the resurgence of China. It should be a broader, a broader conceptualization. Let me turn to some questions now uh, from the audience, and, and I'm trying to group these together so that we can get as many of them as we can. And, and the good news is there are several that are, are related. So the first one is about India, and it kind of goes a little bit off what, what Ali just said in the sense that um, was it a bad move on the part of China, for example, against India that rejuvenated perhaps some, some feelings uh, within things like the Quad, for example, that that was actually the bigger change. It, it was it was that. But let, let me just open that up to all of you, maybe starting with Naima. What, what do we do or where do, what can India do for this relationship? Right, definitely. Well, India is important in many respects, but I do think, I do want to just validate something that you said in the question, which was, uh, was it conflicts that India had with China that might have reinvigorated China's, uh, India's, interest in uh, being involved with the, with the Quad. Um, I think that the border clashes that happened um, between the China-India 
border as of late have played some role. Uh, there is, of course, a very complex relationship between China, Pakistan, India, in that China and Pakistan are very close, and then India and Pakistan are not close, so it's useful for India to be close to the United States in this neighborhood where it has two uh, sort of tightly aligned uh, foes, if you will. And so I think that India has uh, much to gain from being a part of the Quad um, country set of four countries, but also I think that India um, has a large role to play as the largest democracy in the world, as a country that in its own right um, plays like a huge role in the region. And so we've made a strategic shift as of late to referring to the entire region as the Indo-Pacific, as opposed to calling it just the Asian Pacific, largely because of the large role that India has to play in the region. And I don't think that that's something that, um, that the Biden administration takes for example, for uh, takes for, uh, what's the phrase? Granted. <laughs> takes for granted. There we go. And for that reason, um, I, I do expect to see that, that both sides will pursue the relationship more. Um, there was an, in the questions, there's another country that kind of looms large in a few of them. And I'm going to ask um, Raymond this one. What about Russia? If we had this conversation even a few years ago, India would not have been on the table except as an ancillary kind of piece and Russia would have loomed a lot larger. Um, to what extent is Russia part of the future of the US-China relationship? That's an excellent question. Um, I, I saw, side with a, a friend of mine, Paul Post on his kind of view of Russia and that it's, it's just kind of a spoiler. It's there, it's, you know, because of its sheer geography, it's involved in so many different regions, Europe, obviously, South Asia, East Asia, uh, the Arctic as well. Um, and because of its strategic orientation as being a, almost like a, well, just a large rogue petro state, if I can put it that way, um, <clears throat> it has an interest in kind of thumbing its nose and undermining a lot of the sort of initiatives or, or uh, uh, structures that the United States, the EU, and other in Japan, Australia, that they want to push forward. I also think, however, that that makes them a particularly untrustworthy uh, partner for any. Like, so I think in the in the Q and A here, we've got some questions about if you could have Russia and China become coming, uh, working an alliance together, or perhaps also with Iran. I find that to be unlikely, uh, mostly because and this I think comes back to where we started a bit about the ideology and a bit on Ali's points about um, kind of the positive vision for say an alliance, that the cohesive glue of an alliance, but particularly now, is a sort of propulsive, positive, proactive force, a vision of what you want in the international system. China in particular, going back to what Naima said about um, uh, uh, the kind of bilateral preferences in, in diplomacy and security uh, and, and alliances, um, <clears throat> Russia in particular, they, they engage in transactional diplomacy. And one of the big issues with the transactional diplomacy is that everyone else is always worried that you're going to sell them out. And it means it's really, really hard for you to get to, to bring states together and, and, and kind of have that sort of propulsive cohesive force. Um, and that's, I think, what ideology does for, say, NATO or for the US Japan, US ROK alliance. That you have this, you know, if we're getting out of a system or out of relationships based on formal reciprocity, that you're going to scratch my back, but I will specifically scratch this part of your back. And that's what we're going to do. And you're getting into the sort of generalized ruggy form of uh, John, John Ruggy? A uh, generalized form of reciprocity, then you have to have those values as a foundation for that because otherwise states just don't know. Are you just going to sell me out? Are you really, are, this is sort of diffuse reciprocity issue that we've got going on here. Is it actually going to last or are you going to stab me in the back with the, with the first opportunity? So I think, viewed from that lens, Russia is certainly a spoiler, but I'd be really surprised if um, Russia and China and maybe Iran got together and formed this kind of counter quad alliance. I mean, I'm sure what we call it, but uh, it just it wouldn't have much cohesion or it'd be fairly opportunistic, even if it did get established. Great. I think that makes sense. Ali, I'm going to ask you the other kind of group of questions that have come up. What about the Europeans? Again, if we had this conversation a few years ago, EU as a bloc or European specific countries, whether that be uh, Germany, certainly the UK, for example, in their recent integrated review, uh, a global Britain post Brexit kind of romance novel uh, has decided to pivot to the Indo-Pacific as well. What do we do with the Europeans? How can they help or hurt this relationship? So the 
I think that sort of hope springs eternal for sort of a veritably shared transatlantic approach to managing China's resurgence. Uh, I don't know that we will ever get sort of get to that level. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a mixed bag. And I think that the sort of the clearest evidence, uh, the clearest evidence to date, or at least recently, is uh, CHI, the Comprehensive uh, Investment Agreement that that Brussels and Beijing signed, you know, shortly before the Biden administration took office. Um, I think that, uh, and, and in part, it's just because you know we say Brussels, but Brussels is you know we're talking about 27, we're talking about 27 you know member countries that have different threat perceptions, different policy priorities vis-a-vis. Uh, Beijing. So I don't know that I don't know that the United States and the European Union will European Union will achieve total strategic consonance vis-a-vis China. On the other hand, uh, I think you know China, and I think that we see this you know with the way that China has responded. I think quite disproportionately to the sanctions that were imposed with its retaliatory sanctions. Um, it tends to overreach, and so there's a possibility. I think if if we were if we if we were making bets, I suspect most. Most likely, I think that the the uh, Kai agreement between Brussels and Beijing will still probably uh, go through, but it's now encountering a lot more backlash. I mean, if you look at the discussions that are going on in the European Parliament, a lot of individuals are saying, "Look, uh, we just signed this, we just signed this major investment agreement just a couple of months ago or a few months ago with China. They've talked about th- their desire to to enhance cooperation." With the European Union, and now look at the types of retaliatory sanctions that they're imposing. And so there's now a lot more discussion going on in Berlin, in Paris, and other capitals about, you know, how should we navigate this this relationship? So, uh, so I, I think that it's a demonstration one that, you know, on on select issues, I think that on select issues of human rights, um, on so on issues such as human rights, uh, perhaps reconfiguring supply chains. Uh, cultivating alternative sources of perhaps 5G infrastructure. I think that there will be, uh, you know, climate change. I think that there will be sort of select issues where Washington and Brussels are able to come together. I don't think that that means that they will have completely uh, sort of parallel approaches to China's resurgence, but it doesn't mean though that China just sort of has a glide path to erecting a wedge between uh, the United States and the European Union. I think in many cases, um, uh, China is actually contributing more to its own diplomatic encirclement than anybody else. And so I think that, um, and this is why, and then, and then I'll stop here. Uh, while China is indeed, uh, it is a multifaceted competitor. It is a formidable competitor, uh, certainly the most potent economic and technological competitor that the United States has ever confronted. But one of the reasons I'm, you know, and perhaps I'm guilty of being overly sanguine here, but one of the reasons that I, I'm not as concerned as, as some others about the potential for a China that achieves global preeminence, uh, that establishes an entirely new international system, um, is that uh, it's difficult to, I, I would submit, it's difficult to, to, uh, to have a credible path to global preeminence on the basis of, uh, purely on the basis of economic and technological heft. You have to be able to cultivate a baseline, engender a baseline of strategic trust, particularly among the advanced industrial democracies that are still the linchpin of global power. And so I think that until and unless China is able to establish that type of baseline of strategic trust, its economic and technological momentum will allow it to continue to chip away uh, at America's margin of preeminence, will allow it to continue to make inroads globally. But I think that so long as China contributes to its own diplomatic encirclement, um, I don't know that it has a credible path to achieving global preeminence or potentially even regional preeminence. That's, uh, I think, as you said, sanguine, but but probably also quite measured in in in, in outlook. Um, we're gonna we're at time now, so I'm gonna ask you each just for a very very short final word uh, about what you're working on right now vis-a-vis U.S. China and where you see that going. So very very short word about what you're actually working on now, and I'll start with Naima. Working on my PhD. <laughs> I am. As you should uh, be. I am finishing my dissertation at Harvard. My next step will be to join the faculty at Princeton University, where I'll be in the political science department and the School of Policy. And so I really look forward to finishing the dissertation so I can get to the next phase. Awesome. Great. Raymond? Good luck, Naima. That's just final push. It's going to happen. Um, I just recently published a book on uh, US responses to uh, someone behind me over there. Um, U.S. responses to uh, Chinese maritime uh, assertions in the Southeast China Sea. Uh, I've got another book coming out, I think 
June. I've got to look over the index tonight. Um, <clears throat> and it kind of relates to a lot of what we've been discuss, uh, discussing today. And I think the kind of final point I kind of wanted to kind of leave on is the idea that we've talked a lot about what China is going to demand of the United States, but our allies and partners are going to demand a lot as well. Um, and the book focuses on the fact that you, know, you have a quad, you have this sort of informal grouping, but to really demonstrate credible commitment to a region, you have to elevate your relationship, your security relationships uh, to the same as the global standard. And the global standard in this case is NATO. And so are, is the US, going back to an earlier question that you asked, Chris, like, is the US really ready for the, you know, the sort of institution building or the upgrading that's really going to take to demonstrate to Asian countries that they're serious. I, I think that's a really big open question. But Great. read my book to find out. We, we indeed shall. Ali, last word. Thanks, Chris. Well, first of all, uh, Naima, congratulations. And, and Princeton is, is incredibly, incredibly lucky to be uh, getting you. So uh, congratulations. Uh, Raymond, similarly, I mean, two books. Uh, you know, two books in, in, in just a span of a few months is incredible, but I'm, I'm uh, really, really looking forward to reading uh, both of them and learning from both of them. So congrats to you, big congrats to you as well. Um, I'm working on a short book right now on the notion of great power competition vis-a-vis -vis China and Russia um, for, for polity books. And the, I think the core argument that I am uh, gonna try to articulate in, in the book, and it certainly relates to a lot of what we've been discussing this evening is that uh, undoubtedly the management of growing great power tensions, um, it is going to be, it is a critical component of US foreign policy. It will continue to be a critical component of foreign policy. Um, but I think that the United States would be remiss to pursue a foreign policy that is beholden to or driven by uh, China and Russia's actions and declarations. Um, I think that, you know, I, I've sort of one of the through lines of a lot of what I've said this evening is a need for sort of an affirmative vision. And I think that to the extent that the United States can focus on investing in you and its unique competitive advantages, uh, thinking about how it can strengthen the power of its domestic example, um, how it can work with allies and partners to create this more resilient post-pandemic order, to the extent that it can pursue those affirmative vectors and embed within those affirmative pursuits the management of great power tensions, I think that its foreign policy is likely to be far more uh, successful uh, and sustainable. And so the upshot of the book will be how to, how to manage great power tensions, recognizing that neither Russia uh, nor China uh, is 10 feet tall, uh, but managing those tensions within uh, a more affirmative vector. Great. Well, thank you very much, all three of you. Um, as everyone's already said, Naima, congratulations and uh, chin up for the last uh, the last few yards of the uh, of the fight. Um, thank you all for being so generous with your time and your your thoughts today and joining us. Again, uh, you'll have to wait for the Suez shipping uh, event later on. We'll try to put that together. But I don't think there was any better panel to put together for this topic. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you all to those who have joined us and have stayed here so long. Um, couldn't get to all the questions, but but mercifully, a lot of the questions were were able to be lumped together. So if you didn't hear the exact wording, hopefully we were able to kind of at least tick the box a little bit. Uh, thanks very much for for joining us.